Hello, welcome to the March business, uh, sorry, March meeting of the Baton Rouge Astronomical Society. Tonight, our speaker is going to be Dr. Param Singh. He's going to be talking about a journey to the Big Bang and beyond. So, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Singh. Thank you, John. Thank you so much. So, it's my real pleasure to be here with all of you, so much enthusiastic about astrophysics, astronomy, and the universe. And I'm going to tell you some aspects of the story of the Big Bang, basically the ideas, how they develop, and where the state of the art is, what we have learned so far from <laughs> gravity, starting from the Greek astronomy and developing slowly towards the Newtonian ideas, the Einsteinian philosophy, and where does the quantum gravity, which is the modern theory of gravity, teaches us about how do we go beyond the Big Bang. So I'm Param Singh, I'm a professor in physics at LSU. I joined LSU in 2010, and my area of research is trying to understand the unification of Einstein's theory of relativity and quantum mechanics. So that's the area called quantum gravity, I essentially work on uh, this plot here, which is basically the Big Bang, and try to understand the mathematics and the physics of what happened at the Big Bang. And this is some artistic description of the work which I did when I was at Penn State. And uh, I did my PhD in India from Inter University Center for Astronomy and Astrophysics, and I'll come to the person who actually founded that center. Then I came to Penn State in 2000. So, and I did most of my research there on quantum gravity, and that is what I have been continuing now at LSU. So, some part of that will come later in the talk. So, let us first come to the question of what is Big Bang? What is a Big Bang? I'm sorry, like this, this uh, slightly off. So, and that question can be answered, in, that question can be asked in many ways and can be answered in many ways. For example, like we can understand it as the event which was at the birth of our universe. We, if you are more mathematically minded, then we'll try to understand where the gravitational curvature of the space and time becomes infinite. We can also talk about more mathematically the way Penrose and Hawking talked that it's a point in space time where the evolution stops. If you talk about a person who works on the trying to extend Einstein's theory of relativity, they will say like Big Bang is an important event for us because it tells us the limit of the validity of classical gravity. And they will also tell you that's a window to the theory beyond Einstein's theory. That is how I perceive it. And I essentially look at all of these questions in my research, but I won't be talking from this viewpoint. I would be talking more from historical viewpoint, which I think is more fun than this mathematical viewpoint. So, what is a Big Bang? I think Big Bang is perhaps the most important event in universe history, which could never be the part of the story of the universe which Newton and Einstein tried to write. Both of them, in their picture of the universe, Big Bang was not there. They both believed our universe is static. It will not have any such explosion on which we understand as the Big Bang. So this talk will be mostly about the development of those ideas, why were Newton and Einstein, they were inclined towards it, what shaped their, uh, their wisdom, and how did we went forward from there. So we would like to understand what were the ideas before the story of Big Bang came in, who actually coined the word Big Bang, that also itself is pretty interesting. Why Big Bang cannot be in the final story of the cosmos, I'll try to convince you that, that even though yes, if you pick up any textbook of astrophysics or cosmology today, it will start from the Big Bang, but certainly that's not going to be in the final story if whenever new textbooks are written after a few decades. And what lies beyond the Big Bang and what replaces it. So let's let's go far, far in past with some speculations and earlier speculations even before the Greek astronomers, like some Vedic philosophers in India, they thought that Earth is supported by four elephants, but that elephant is standing on a surface, a big turtle, that turtle is being grabbed by a huge cobra who's eating, eating his own tail. So a lot of Indian mythology goes into that, like it has an idea of like cyclic evolution and so on, and but the idea was that we have some sort of a, I don't know, maybe they 
assume the flat earth or what, but they have these four elephants and a turtle and so on. Similar ideas were there also in the Greek philosophy. Early Greek philosophers like Thales thought that the earth is basically flat and it's floating on water. This is Archimedes, which is being depicted on this flat earth floating on water with, with ether and so on around him. However, these ideas were just mere speculations. And the earliest scientific, or what I would say is the natural philosophy ideas, which developed from the Greek astronomy, were from Aristotle and Plato. And Aristotle thought that Earth is the center of the universe, and the stars move in perfect circles. Why perfect? Why circles? Because circle is a perfect figure, and that's the divine figure. That was a divine figure for Aristotle and Plato, who believed everything is going to be made up of whole numbers. So when you look up in the sky, well, I don't have to tell you anything about this. I'm, I'm absolutely not even an amateur. Uh, I have a telescope which I struggle to use. So the point is that we know that these are all these beautiful circles which we see in the sky, and they were observed in in the when the Greek astronomers were looking up. The idea is that even though like, so the, they thought that Earth is the center of the universe and these all these heavenly bodies move around in perfect circles. But the point is that they also saw some exceptions to this phenomenon and they were very disturbed with that. And that is of planets, especially like Mars, which has a retrograde motion. And they were trying to explain that, well, this is, this is something an influence it, it can be influence of a couple of things, but they thought that perhaps that if there are planets, which they used to call a uh, planet's word itself comes from the wandering star, they thought like it's not going in a perfect circle, but it's wandering and so on. Maybe these planet, planetary objects have their some sort of a natural force of themselves. They, if they can go against this divine order of perfect circles, then perhaps they can also influence mankind. And that is actually the root of the birth of astrology that they thought that these planets like Mars, Venus, and Jupiter, and so on, if they can have exceptions to these perfect circles, then perhaps they can also influence us. So this was the main idea. Yes, there was an issue that the planets go in these uh, wandering circles and so on, and they do not have the motion which we see of the stars which are going around the Earth. These ideas were there, and they were further refined by Ptolemy, and Ptolemy came up with a model of, of which was a geocentric model of the universe, in which the idea was that the retrograde motion which we see of the planets, it's described by epicycles. And the idea was that we have the Earth at the center, we have Mercury and Moon going around Earth. But if you look at, for example, Venus, or if you look at the Mars, the, they have their own cycles, own circles, while they're moving around the Earth. And Ptolemy, by adjusting the radii, of these epicycles was able to produce very accurate description of all the motion of planets which we saw in the sky. So Ptolemy's model was refined and refined further and eventually became a highly complex model, but it was very accurate, quite accurate to describe what was happening to planets around, around Earth when they were moving. So this model survived for 2,000 years, and we will come to it. Like even Copernican ideas were not able to throw this model out very quickly. But there were some rebels to these ideas from the very beginning. For example, Aristarchus of Samos, he gave the first heliocentric model in 300 BC. His idea was that there is a central fire, which is in Greek philosophy, and he said like that central fire is nothing but the sun. And his idea was that Earth will not be the center of the universe, and it will be central fire, which will be the center of the universe. But the idea of the perfect circles was still there in, in, by, by Aristarchus also. There was also an Indian uh, mathematician, Aryabhata, in 499 Pomonera. He argued that Earth is not fixed, and it revolves around the north-south axis. That is why stars have a particular apparent motion in circles. And this beautiful statue is in the institute where I did my PhD, and that very common table behind, that is where I used to spend most of my morning when I was doing my PhD. I'll come to the person who actually created this very beautiful institute, and it's a, it's a, it's a great center in Asia for astronomy and astrophysics. Okay, so let's come to the heliocentric model, 
And the Ptolemy's ideas were continuing for a very, very long time. They were completely in coherence with the religious philosophy of that time. So it had huge amount of backing. And Earth is really the center of the universe and things move around Earth. Whether they are epicycles and so on, there were refinements always coming. So Copernicus was, was trained by church, essentially, and he was asked by Rome to fix the problems in the calendar in 1514. In the same year, he came up with a, a small pamphlet of 20 pages in which he described his ideas of Earth not being at the center of the universe. But he was a very shy person. He knew also that all of his findings will go against whatever church teaches and he was very reclusive. He would not talk to people much about his findings. Till there was a, a German a young guy in 1539 called Joachim von Lauschen. He spent three years with Copernicus learning with him and Copernicus was already already uh, dying with certain disease. And in spring of 1543, uh, Lauschen, he published this work of Copernicus, the, the, Revolu the revolutionary bus of Copernicus, and which was dedicated to Pope Paul III. Mm -hmm. They knew that it should be dedicated to some Pope because they really needed mm -hmm. a better protection for what they were saying. So, so this was this guy, von Roshan. And unfortunately, like Copernicus was not really able to enjoy any royalties which could have come from his book because that book was published on the very last day of his life. He saw that book before he was dying. He essentially died when the book was published. The main idea of the book was that the universe was finite. So, so that was not against the religious philosophy again. It was a sphere of fixed stars. The planets and Earth, they move around sun. Even though Copernicus gave this idea, and people at that time, some of the best brilliant minds of that time, they realized it's a beautiful idea. It never became popular because Ptolemy's model was so sophisticated that Copernican model did not really survive before the Ptolemy's epicyclic model also. So it took really long time once Kepler and once Galileo started coming in that the heliocentric model really became established. But in the early days it was not really thought of as a, any competitor to Ptolemy's idea. Okay, so Tycho Brahe is another character in this story and he gave a hybrid model. He was a very lavish, lavishly living, very rich person. He was a friend of King Frederick II of Denmark. And his friend gave him an island 10 kilometers from the Denmark's coast. He had a most lavish astronomical observatory of all times. And its annual budget was 5% of Denmark's GDP. So it was huge. He lived a very lavish life. He was a great astronomer. He made with all the technology he had, like he produced most accurate astronomical observations, and he suddenly found that Ptolemy's model is incorrect, that it's not going to work, the uh, theory of the cycles and so on. So he developed a hybrid of Ptolemy's and Copernicus model. He was very sympathetic to Copernicus' ideas, but somehow, I'm not sure why, and I was not able to figure out from the, when I was looking at the history of this, that why he didn't just accept Copernicus' model. In his model, <laughs> which was in 1588, all planets except Earth, they orbit around Sun, and then this whole family of Sun and all planets minus the Earth, they move around the Earth. So it was a really a hybrid of Ptolemy's idea, which had some hypercycles too, and then of the Copernicus model. So this is like the Earth, and then there is a moon around the Earth, and this is the Sun with its own family going around the Earth, and then there are heavenly stars which are going around the Earth. Earth and so on. So quite, quite a lavish, quite a lavish model, like this lavish life. So he, he developed this model in 1588, but unfortunate things started happening to him in 1588. First of all, it is known that King Frederick II died the same year, uh, probably because of over drinking. And the next <coughs> king, and I think it was King Charles IV or something of Denmark, he was not agreeing with the lavish lifestyle which was being espoused on on Tycho Brahe, he cut off the funding. Tycho Brahe had to go to Prague, and he was he was made the imperial mathematician in Prague. And in Prague, he met a very young fellow uh, from very humble beginnings, Kepler, in 1600. And they were a great team. So Tycho Brahe was a great astronomer, and Kepler was a more mathematically minded fellow who, who thought like he can solve 
any problem which is there in astronomy very easily using his mathematical abilities. In 1601, Tycho Brahe died, which was actually very fortunate even for Kepler because Tycho Brahe would have never allowed Kepler to really pursue what he was saying because of his prestige and so on. And the Kepler got all the observations which Brahe had made and he found, he thought that he has to find a new way, which is not such a hybrid way, not such a complicated way to describe the observation. So he initially thought it would take him just two weeks to figure out everything. It actually took him eight years to figure out the observations of Tycho Brahe and come up with a model which really describes those observations. So the, the real problem was that Kepler was trying to fit perfect circles in those observations. He knew that Ptolemy's model is wrong. He knew, and he also figured out that Copernicus' model is also not correct because it is based on perfect circles. And Kepler knew that somehow fitting perfect circles is not going to work. He tried for eight years, he gave up eventually, and he figured out that the best way to describe the planetary motion is that they move in ellipses in a heliocentric model. So that is one part of the story. After this, the Cap once Kepler found this, something around 1609 or something, all the glory was taken away by Galileo. The reason is that Kepler got so much intrigued with the idea that he went back to Plato and Aristotelian ideas in trying to prove that motion of planets produce musical harmonies and you can hear them or observe them and so on. So this idea was thrown out. And, but it's also to the credit of Kepler that he wrote one of the first science fiction novels called Somi, in which he imagined that there will be future future astronauts or something which will go to moon and discover moon and so on. So that is the first instance of where the, some sort of a lunar exploration is thought about. Something in 1615 or something like that. Anyway, so once Kepler had established this model, it was pretty clear that Ptolemy's model was wrong and it was actually Copernicus heliocentric model coupled with the ellipses which turned out to outshine everything. But the final blow to the Aristotelian ideas didn't come from Kepler's work. It was actually Galileo's work. So Galileo in 1609, with a telescope, he observed lunar mountains and sunspots and proved that heavenly bodies are not perfect. So this was the main, one of the two main founding pillars of the Aristotelian philosophy, that heavenly bodies are not perfect, they don't go in perfect circles, was already proved by Kepler, but still, like there was a mounting evidence in upcoming that there are lunar mountains and there are even sun has spots. So early on, in the in the time of Ptolemy and Aristotle, when people used to point out, well, how can you say that these astronomical bodies are perfect? Look at moon, it has so many spots and so many stars or so on. Their answer was that moon is too close to corrupt earth and has got corrupted, <laughs> and that is why it has all these spots and so on. But look at sun, it is bright golden object. There is nothing on it. So when when Galileo found sunspots, it was a dashing blow to that to that speculation too. The second thing, which is very important, which played a very important role in physics, was the principle of equivalence, which which Galileo proved. Now it was very obvious intuitively to many natural philosophers before Galileo that if I if you throw a paper napkin, if if I throw a paper napkin, for example, here and this pointer at the same time, this is certainly going to reach earlier. A heavier person will fall, fall from the chair earlier than a lighter kid. So this was pretty obvious, but it's wrong, you know that. So Galileo proof from the leaning tower of Pisa I used to throw objects. We know that all that story. But the interesting part of the story is that people thought he's a joker, he's a crackpot, and people thought that he's playing tricks while he's throwing these two objects and maybe trying to push the lighter object faster. And people didn't believe him for a very long time till they themselves did this experiment and Galileo actually won. The principle of equivalence for falling objects made the most important, it was the most radical discovery, theoretically, which really completely demolished the Aristotelian philosophy. So Aristotelian philosophy, or what was, whose result was also Ptolemy's model and so on, it was based on having the heavenly bodies going in perfect order, universe being finite, and everything remaining static, things happening only at a local scale. So that was the main message of that. All that was crashing slowly. And at that time, Newton came 
with his ideas of gravity. All the other ideas from the Copernicus, Kepler, and Galileo were before him. And standing on these giants, he found that he found a paradigm in which he said that the space and time acts like a fixed stage. That he said space is like a fixed stage on which the planets and stars move. Time is completely separate from space, and this acts like just a fixed background. But not everyone agreed with his ideas, and I would like to mention two people, like one of them was Leibniz, who, is, who was one of the peers of uh, Newton, he was one of the founding fathers of calculus. He, Leibniz thought that space and time are not separate entities. He thought that space, time, and matter, which are very different roles in Newtonian philosophy, they are actually different sides of the same cube. He thought that they are relational to each other. He thought you cannot define matter without defining space and time, and you cannot define space and time without defining matter. So this relational nature of space, time, and matter would play a very important role when Einstein came up with the theory of relativity. Newton never liked these ideas. First, because he never liked Leibniz himself, but he never liked these ideas at all. He thought that these relational ideas really don't make any sense. These are just philosophical uh, gimmicks. The main point is that the space and time is completely fixed. The space doesn't talk to time, and it's a completely different dimension. And the planets move as if they are moving as actors on a fixed stage. The way I'm moving, that is how the planets move on this space and time. But much later, after Leibniz and Newton, there was this philosopher Mark, who, following Leibniz, came up with a principle that the inertia of an object is determined by all other objects. Very, 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 like, absolutely radical idea which he put forward that inertia means that essentially the, the ability of an object to resist change, whatever is that ability which I have, is determined by every other object, not only in this room, but even in the whole entire universe. Both of these ideas very much influenced Einstein, and they, they were the forming pillars of Einstein's theory of relativity. So let's come to Einsteinian ideas. The first important principle of Einsteinian idea is that it's a relational theory. It's not based on the Newtonian ideas of space being fixed and time being separate. It was based on the Leibniz idea that everything is relational. Space and time and matter, they are all defined in relation to each other. And he took the Markian principle and the principle of equivalence, and then these were the two guiding philosophies for him. When he came up with Einstein's, when he came up with his theory of general relativity. The main message of general relativity is that gravity is not a force like an electric force or a nuclear force, it is dynamics of space and time itself. Planets move around stars because a star bends the space and time, and the planet is just moving in that neighborhood. The motion of heavy objects affects the space and time. So, space and time was no longer a background stage in Einsteinian philosophy. It changes as the actor moves on this stage. So, for example, like imagine instead of this fixed floor, if this was a water pad and if I was moving on it, my walking will be very difficult. As I will move, the, the water bed will bend, will back react on me, and I will back react on that water bed. That is why Einstein's theory of general relativity is a highly nonlinear theory. Working with it is very difficult, not like a Newtonian theory of gravity, because the space and time is nothing but the dynamics of matter itself and matter reacts to it, back reacts to it, and back reacts again to space and time. So one illustration is this. So for example, if you take this rubber sheet, you put a heavy weight on it, which acts like a star, for example, and this small marble going around it is essentially the motion of a planet around that, around that big heavy object, which acts like this rubber sheet acts like a well. So or in other words, like if we had that vision of space time, uh, then if we have some planet here, it bends the fabric of space-time around, and then a satellite of that planet will move around exactly in that well, in a very same way as this marble is moving around this, this heavy object. As the mass of this object will increase, this bending will increase. And if this density of this object becomes catastrophic, then this bending will completely rip the space-time fabric, and that we will see is the singularity. So let's first come to the expanding universe. So before we come to the notion of Big Bang and so on, it's important to look at the expanding universe. 
So some important discoveries happened from the spectra emitted by galaxies. Hubble in 1920s discovered that they are moving farther from each other. The fainter the galaxy, the, far, the, faint, the fainter the galaxy, the faster it recedes from us. This was very counterintuitive to Einstein, who still believed that the universe is static, the universe is finite. Yes, the, the, the model is heliocentric, but there are many such systems, many such galaxies, many such systems in the universe, but the whole idea is that the universe will be a static object. Friedman and Lemaitre, they found a solution of Einstein's theory in which universe was expanding. So these were essentially two mathematicians. Lemaitre was a priest. Friedman, uh, sorry, Friedman was a mathematician. Lemaitre was a priest, but great interest in physics and mathematics. Both of them were playing with the Einstein's theory of relativity. And they found that, well, instead of having a static solution, you can also have a solution in which the universe expands like a balloon and in which the galaxies will go away and will explain what Hubble had seen in 1920s. So if the, if the universe expands like a balloon, it must have started from somewhere. And that li limit record would be a primeval atom, which we'll later identify as a state of a Big Bang or something. And Einstein, of course, didn't like this idea. He thought that this whole idea is going, is taking the relativity in completely wrong direction and the universe should be static. Later on, Einstein will call this as well. I will, will, even very much later, he still didn't like the idea, but was always hopeful that somehow the static universe will come back. By 1930s, most of the scientific community acknowledged the expansion of the universe, which Hubble had seen. And they also were starting to acknowledge Friedman and Lemaitre's model in which they were able to describe this expanding universe with do Einstein's equation. But this, these discoveries were leading to many doubts and many questions. First of all, if this universe is like a balloon which is expanding, then this balloon must have started from somewhere. And that is that led to the question, how did the universe begin? How do the galaxies form? Where are all this matter creation happening and so on? There was a particular reason that Einstein did not like the idea. He was, he knew that there is going to be a problem if this is true. So let us look at that problem. And that is a big problem. The point is that an expanding universe, if you time reverse it, if you look backward, if you run its moving in time, then it keeps on contracting. An expanding universe keeps on contracting. And eventually it will reach a size zero. When it reaches the size zero, the matter contained remains same, but the volume of the universe becomes zero. That means the density of the universe becomes infinite. When the density becomes infinite, the space-time fabric will completely rip apart. And that infinite bending of space-time will cause a singularity to occur. This singularity won't occur just at the beginning of the universe, but also will occur at the center of the black holes. So this idea was very troubling. The idea, I, Einstein knew that if Friedman and Lemaitre are correct, Hubble has already discovered that galaxies are moving away from each other. This is completely going to destroy his theory because a theory cannot have a singularity then the theory is incomplete. So there were various people trying to look for a loophole in what Friedman and Lemaitre were trying to propose. So one of the loopholes was one, one of the persons who thought that there can be a loophole was Sir Arthur Eddington, who was a great friend of Einstein, one of his greatest advocates. Similarities were first discovered in 1940s for universes which are homogeneous. So Eddington knew, Eddington thought that, look, you have found the singularity, but you have made drastic assumptions. That drastic assumption is that you have assumed the universe looks same in all directions and you have assumed that the matter density is homogeneous in all directions. And he said, look, even in, the, even in this room, the, the universe doesn't look same in all the directions and we have different densities. So how can you make such simplifying assumptions? So Eddington thought that he strongly believed that for universes which do not look in same three directions, which are called anisotropic universes, initial singularity will be absent. There will be no big bang. He acknowledged that yes, if you assume that universe is perfectly homogeneous and it is isotropic, means the matter has the same density everywhere and it looks the same in all directions, then yes, if you evolve those that universe backwards, there will be big bang. But his loophole was he, he was looking for a loophole that once you have a universe which doesn't look same in all the directions, then there will be no singularity. So I quote him philosophically. The notion of the beginning of the present order of the nature is repugnant to me. I should like to find a genuine loophole. And Eddington was really pushing that for the idea the universe is static. 
very much similar to the old religious philosophies which were there. But these ideas greatly influenced a young person who later became Sir Fred Hoyle. Sir Fred Hoyle was highly influenced by these ideas of Eddington and Einstein, and he was looking for a theory which can describe the motion of galaxies without giving up, a, giving up the idea of static universe without bringing in the Big Bang. So let me first come to come to this part, the steady state theory, which, and, and then I will come to the part of the Big Bang. So this was advocated by Sir Fred Hoyle, by Herman Bondi, by Burbages, and by Nalikar. So this is that Nalikar was a student of Fred Hoyle who made that institute in which I did my PhD. The steady state theory was based on perfect cosmological principle, which was a much more uh, naturally simplifying principle than those existed earlier. In which the idea is that the universe is not even same in space, but also at any point in time. The universe was always like this, so the universe had a steady state. And then when the question came, like, how do we find the formation of galaxies? Then steady state theory said that there is some sort of a creation field, and the imbalance from that creation field creates the matter which we see in the universe. This was the most popular theory at that time, because the rival theory was based on some sort of nucleosynthesis phenomena which was being understood. And that theory was originating from Lemaitre's work and was being propagated by George Gamow. And when people used to ask people who had who were proponents of steady state theory, they used to laugh on their competitors that there is really no evidence of that primeval atom. If there was that primeval atom, where is the observational signature of that? So steady state theory was the biggest, biggest thing in the market at that time, in 1950s and in 1960s. But let's come to the Big Bang. Who coined the word Big Bang and how did we have the Big Bang theory? So George Gamow was trying to understand chemistry, essentially like how does hydrogen, helium, lithium and other elements form in the history of the universe. He was really trying to understand how do, how do these elements form. He had some interest in nuclear physics also. And he figured out that he figured out various details of the Mithrace model, and he figured out that it must start from an ultra dense state of matter from which the elements will originate. His idea was that there will be an ultra dense state, what Mithrace called as primeval atom, and there will be some sort of an explosive, highly thermal phenomena which will lead to these, which will lead to all the elements we see. Obviously, one of the one of the symptoms of this theory was that there will be a cosmic microwave background radiation. So Gamma predicted that there will be a cosmic microwave background radiation. It will be a very cold radiation, and it will be very difficult to dis discover, but it will be there, and that will be the or that will be the signature of this this idea of limitry and Gamow's theory, essentially of Gamow's theory. Big Bang was actually coined by his art rival Sir Fred Hoyle in a BBC interview in April 1949, and this is the quotation from that interview in and and. And Fred Hoyle used to really derive Gamow and all of these ideas. And he here he says that these theories, which are based on the hypothesis that all the matter in the universe was created in some big bang in a particular time in the remote past, and then he continues by saying that we have not found that radiation. There is no such radiation, and the absence of that radiation really proves out that this big bang idea of Gamow is a crackpotish idea. He goes on deriding them like that, but eventually. Well, and, and I also want to mention that there is a very, Gamow wrote many, many beautiful books on popular science, and this is one very beautiful book, or it has many versions, it is also in the EBR library, in which like he has a character called Mr. Tompkins, who sleeps in a lecture like this, for example, dreams of a universe with hypothetical numbers, and then he realizes in his dream how physics really works, how quantum physics really works, Relatively really works and so on. So it's a very nice book if you want to read. Okay, so Gamow had this idea, but then the question was at the same time, lots of other things were happening. And people knew that if Gamow's ideas are there, then there will be the problem of similarities. And on, on this front, there were some developments in 1950s which are very important. So Eddington had thought that if you include anisotropic universes, if the universe doesn't look around in the, same in different directions, then similarities will not be there. But this Indian physicist, Amal Kumar Rai Chaudhary, he proved Eddington wrong in 1950s, 1954, 1955. 
he showed that singularities exist even for space times which are not same in different directions which are in asymptotic space time. so this was a blow to Eddington's idea and in 1960s following this work and then going in many different directions Bob Garrosh, Roger Penrose, Sir Roger Penrose and Stephen Hawking they proved that the singularities in fact are very generic features of all the space times in Einstein's theory of general relativity they are just there you can't get out of them and the, if Einstein's general theory of relativity is the theory of is, is the theory of gravity we will have to learn how to live with the singularities and then Penrose proposed the ideas about the cosmic sensitive hypothesis that you won't really see the singularity in a black hole and so on but those are those those are for some different topics someday but the main point was starting from Raj Chaudhary's work and following from Garrosh, Penrose and Hawking it was established in 50s and by mid 60s that the problem of singularities is not going away we have mm -hmm. to live with that Something else was happening at that time, and I think it's, it's pretty interesting. Like this happened from geopolitics, and having the pictures of Sputnik mm -hmm. and the first landing on Moon is very interesting here. So let me mention some things. So during the World War II, Arthur C. Clarke was conceptualizing that perhaps in future the communications will be happening with some satellites which will be orbiting around the Earth. Now in 1957, we had Sputnik 1, and then there was a big crisis in essentially the science here. So in 1958, NASA was born as a reaction to this in collaboration with Bell Labs. They were trying to understand how to do this communication that if Soviets have sent this satellite, then how do we counter that plan? And their idea was that perhaps we can have the satellites in the form of balloons. There will be balloons which will be floating around Earth. That was called Project Echo. And these balloons will be <coughs> bouncing off the radio communications across the continents, across the seas. And we'll be able to observe them with certain very powerful radio antennas, and then we'll be able to communicate. So Bell Labs were in charge of running these antennas. One of those antennas was in New Jersey, and people were working on trying to reduce the noise which was coming from these antennas. And this was a very difficult task because when they will send the signals, there will be so much of noise of everything that the signal will just not come. So, for example, Ohm, which, which is a unit now for resistance and so on, he was one of the ones who was working on the sources of the microwave noise. In 1964, Penzias and Wilson were working very hard to eliminate the noise of a super sensitive horn antenna, one of the first ones in New Jersey, and to detect the radio communication. But they were not able to really eliminate everything except the mysterious noise. They even went inside with this horn antenna, which I'll show you in the next slide, cleaning all the pigeon droppings, relocating the pigeons who were building nests there and so on, 50 kilometers away from there. But still, there was some very strange noise, which they were not able to remove at all. And they were, everyone was baffled for a very, very long time, starting from 1959 to 1964. This was around the very same time when Penrose and Hawking were trying to also do their work on similarity theory. Well, actually, that noise, so this is Penzias and Wilson, this is that horn antenna in New Orleans, and they even cleaned it, they, they used to climb it up and clean up all the bird droppings and so on, so that the noise can be really extracted. But that noise was coming from outside our galaxy, that is what they found. It has no local source. And the most recent, one of the most recent pictures of that noise is this, this is the cosmic microwave background radiation. They were actually seen through this horn antenna. The discovery of this cosmic microwave background radiation around at the same time with the Penrose and Hawking theorems really ruled out steady state theory. Like the mathematically it was in big trouble, the whole idea of the static universe, which was coming from Greek philosophy. And the C and VR, the cosmic microwave background radiation, along with Gamos and others work on nucleosynthesis, which was describing everything without the existence of this mysterious creation field. Steady state theory essentially crashed, crashed in few few years completely and goes out of the game. There were other parts of this steady state theory, which are now called quasi steady state theory and so on. And Professor Nalikar is still alive and is still working on that theory. But there are very few followers of that approach now. So the Big Bang idea stuck, the name stuck, thanks to Fred Hoyle himself. And this is essentially an incomplete history of our universe. Incomplete because we have the problem of Big Bang, the problem of singularity is still there. And essentially, like if you assume that Big Bang happened at time t equal to zero, 
then in 10 to the power minus 32 of seconds. The phenomenon of inflation, it, end, it ended, which, which essentially was a phenomenon in which there was an exponential expansion of the universe. In the first microseconds, protons form. In 100 seconds, light elements form. In 100 million years, the first stars form. In 4 million years, the star formation peak. And somewhere here, our Earth, Earth the solar system form, and so on. But this is an incomplete history, and we would like to understand what is beyond that or what replaces this Big Bang. Now, to complete this history, we have to understand the nature of the universe at extremely small scales. So here the universe really shrinks to lengths which are even smaller than 10 to the power minus 30th of a meter. So it, it goes extremely small, so we have to really understand what happens there at many microscopic scales. So extremely dense object, the density of the entire universe concentrated in the smallest scales. It's a very difficult problem. So the solving the Big Bang problem requires a marriage of quantum and gravity, because quantum essentially is the theory which describes a microscopic world and the gravity is needed because it's applying to the whole gravitational system of the universe and this union is extremely important for us to find the unified theory of the universe. if we don't have the theory of quantum gravity we do not have a unification of physics we have the unsolved problem in the einstein theory the einstein theory is, is beautifully correct at large scales we have found gravitational waves we are finding new black hole mergers and neutron star mergers and confirming the detection of gravitational waves in future too. But that actually brings the challenge much bigger that to fix this problem, we have to also solve the problem of singularity. It's a very difficult problem because the nature of quantum and gravity is not to talk to each other the way they are. So let's see why. So the properties, let's first briefly look at the properties of nature at the quantum scale. And we have seen that in the movies also now that if you shrink a human being to microscopic scales uh, all the predictive power of where it came or she or where they are it completely diffuses and they become like a fuzzy cloud the microscopic world is governed from very different with, with very different mathematics and very different philosophy instead of trajectories we have probabilities so if this is a classical picture of a hydrogen atom in which there is a proton and an electron is moving around it this is the actual picture of the electrons around so this is the theoretical modeling of the electrons around the protons a cloud of electrons around a proton there is you cannot localize an electron here and then there will be orbitals which are which which are different depending on the energies and this is a real picture of a hydrogen atom you know, proton which we can't see and then a cloud around it and then another cloud around it and so on so this this is a proton essentially electron cloud around it. so very diffuse we can't really see like where the where the particles very different kind of philosophy from what we have in newtonian and einsteinian ideas where we where it was very easy to say like a planet is going around a star we can't even say that here that electron is going around a proton it's just a cloud around another cloud okay so quantum theory is necessary for stability of atoms this was well known that if you take rutherford for example was trying to develop a model of an atom in beginning of the previous century based on a solar system idea so there will be a proton and a charged particle will be moving around it but it turns out that this model is highly unstable it ends in few microseconds and then it was actually Niels Bohr who proved that if these electrons have specific energy levels only and they cannot orbit like that the electron cannot take any arbitrary energy then the atom will become stable so the discreteness was important for stability of atoms this quantum discreteness was very important, and this quantum discreteness is given by the Planck's constant. And many of the physicists think that this, the way this quantum discreteness solved this problem, instability of matter, perhaps this quantum discreteness is also going to solve this instability of the space-time factor when gravity is being approached. So that is the main idea of quantum gravity. When the universe becomes extremely tiny near the Big Bang, using quantum theory is important. It is required for fundamental stability of microstructure of space time. That is what is being hypothesized. But how do we find this quantum description of space and time? So let's look at why this is why this marriage has so far not been successful and why we are still working on it. The point is that on one side we have quantum world which is probabilistic. There are no trajectories in the quantum world like in the Newtonian or Einsteinian theories. But the quantum world 
or the quantum mechanics uses the idea of Newtonian philosophy that it is based on a fixed space time. On the other hand, gravity is dynamics of space time. That's what we learned from Einstein's theory. Space time background cannot be fixed to correctly understand gravity. If you want to describe the motion of a black hole or you want to describe a black hole merger, then you cannot fix the space time background and think of black holes merging because black hole is a space time in itself. This is like two actors just dissolving into each other on a stage which is back reacting on the two actors. So it's a very different kind of dynamics. So on one hand, we need a fixed space time. On the other hand, you cannot fix the space time. On one hand, you need you cannot have trajectories, but this one is completely based on trajectories. So what do we do? So what we see is that in this union, which will eventually happen, in the quantum gravity, the space time itself will become quantum. And now you have to understand how do we do physics without any background space time. So imagine a textbook of physics which starts not by saying, let's have this as your position vector and this is your clock. Now you can't have that. If you want to do quantum gravity, you cannot even start with space time. You have to start from much, much abstract level in mathematics. And then the notion of space and time has to emerge from those abstract notions, which are pre-space time. So space time itself has to emerge from such things. As a, in a quantum world. So it's a very difficult exercise. And there are two proponents, two, two main ideologies behind this. One is string theory, which I'm not going to talk about. String theory is a much more ambitious idea, which is based on extra dimensions. Actually, my PhD was more in the string theory, and I turned towards more after my PhD, my work has been more in the rival theory, which is loop quantum gravity. In loop quantum gravity, it's less ambitious. The idea is that we want to we want to quantize this. We want to understand just the marriage of quantum theory and Einstein's theory. In string theory, the main message is that we want to unify everything from scratch. And then quantum gravity will emerge out of it. So in loop quantum gravity, in which I work on now, is in the space time is made up of quantum threads which loop around and intersect each other in this very abstract sense. And each thread carries information about how to construct a nearby space or so something like this. So if you have these threads here, and then when something intersects these threads, then the motion of the space emerges. Essentially, what is fundamental in this loop quantum gravity is very much like the tile structure we see on this floor. If you are 100, 100 meters away from this, from this floor, you won't see these tiles. These tiles will look very smooth to you. So that is the idea. That is space and time have this quantum tile structure and which emerges only at extremely high energies. And when you are at low energies, the space and time looks very smooth. And Einstein's theory of general relativity will recover from it. Another thing which happens is that you cannot divide the tile further. If I want to replace it, if something breaks in this room on this tile, I'll have to go to home to one to get exactly that same tile. I cannot, it will look, it, I cannot really divide the tile further than what is there. It also means that once you cannot divide the space further, there will be no Big Bang. It's very intuitive now. Because the Big Bang essentially is caused when the universe goes to size zero. If somebody comes and tells, well, the universe cannot shrink beyond this time, the shrinkage of the universe will stop and the universe is going to bounce back. So that is the main philosophical idea of what replaces the Big Bang. The Big Bang is an artifact of assuming in Einstein's theory that you can keep dividing space and time as small as you want. But the main message of quantum gravity is that you can't do that because there is a fundamental discreteness coming from Planck's constant, h bar, and that won't allow you to divide the quantum tiles further. So these quantum tiles are of the Planck size. These are like 10 to the power minus 33 meters, 10 to the power minus 30 meters of size. So this is just an artistic description, obviously. So what happens is that if you have this picture of the quantum tiles, and this was my work when I was a postdoc in Penn State, and I have been continuing this for last last many years now with my group at LSU doing high performance computing, trying to understand different types of universes. So in one such universe, so this artistic impression of what appeared in New Scientist on, from our work, we found that if you have a universe which is classical on this side, like Einsteinian universe on this side, in which there will be galaxies and so on, if you go backwards, then instead of the Big Bang, once you reach these very high energy densities, of the universe, the universe, the, these quantum tiles of loop quantum gravity will force you to bump the universe to bounce. And when it bounces, the universe actually bridges to another universe, 
which is again classical on the other side. So the idea is that the universe, if you if you rewind the movie of the universe and look quantum gravity, what it predicts is, and this has been confirmed by many groups now internationally through different simulations and so on, that if you go backwards, the universe will not go to a big bang, but leap into another universe, which will bridge between them. And this bridge is completely non-singular, completely deterministic in the quantum sense, the evolution from one point to another. You have, we have a complete quantum theory which describes this. What we don't have so far is obviously we have, we still this picture is for homogeneous universes. So you have to think of that the slide which I showed about Rai Chaudhary and Penrose and Hawking and so on, the way Rai Chaudhary showed that even if you have homogeneous universe, which is an isotropic similarity is there. We are at that stage now, if we want to rewrite the history. We are still waiting, and I'm still waiting for my students who will be Penrose and Hawking probably one day, and who are non-singularity theorem. But there are no similarities if you have quantum gravity. So that stage is still to come. So we are not there yet. So don't think that this is the final picture. This is perhaps a trailer of what will happen. And maybe this whole thing will be wrong, and there will be another uh, counter theory which will which will prove itself right. So there will be a big, there will be no big bang. There will be actually a big bounce. The universe will expand. And then as soon as the universe slightly expands from this Planckian volume, everything which we know about Einstein's theory turns out to be correct. The theory quickly becomes Einstein's theory. It just near the Big Bang similarity departs from that. And it is due to the discreteness of space-time. The, the gravity actually becomes repulsive instead of being attractive in that very instant when this bounce is happening. So the picture which we have is that the quantum of space-time in least signatures, like the testing theory for the Big Bang the theory of gap was the existence of the cosmic microwave background radiation. That will still form in this because there will be a hot explosive bounce which will make this cosmic microwave background radiation. But the challenge on which we are working now is that what will be the signatures of this quantum geometry or these quantum tiles? Can we really see those signatures somewhere here in the cosmic microwave background? And can we have unique signatures which are not available in other models of the of this of this of this picture also have to say like so far at least on the string theory side there is no resolution of similarity for big bang or for black hole similarities string theory is a very powerful approach by itself personally i do not think that they are counter to each other but there is really no there is really no resolution of similarity in the string theory let me just summarize so what I feel is that Big Bang is an artifact of assuming that the classical nature of space-time does not change when the energy densities become extremely high and the volumes are close to vanishing. As quantum discreteness was necessary and is necessary to prove the stability of atoms, many of us believe that it is going to play a very important role to resolve the Big Bang singularity. This view is also held by string theorists that somehow the quantum discreteness is going to play a very important role to resolve the similarities. So in the loop quantum gravity, at least there is no big bang. So partly the Einstein was certainly correct and Newton was correct. There was no big bang, but in a different way. Our ex there is an expanding universe which is connected to a contracting universe through a quantum gravitational bridge by a big bounce. And I only gave an example of contracting and expanding. You can also have models in which the universe cycles through through different bounces and becomes larger with each cycle and so on. Depends on what matter we put in. And once you put in the right matter, you can get your favorite, favorite model out of it. So big challenge is how to connect it to cosmic microwave background, how to extract those signatures reliably and uniquely. So I will pause here, and maybe after a few years, I can talk more about this story. Mm -hmm. Yes, any questions? I have actually one to comment. That probably every kid 3,000 years ago asked, What holds the snakes up? <laughs> so you I know, think, like, but this is what is going on. Uh, does the laws of thermodynamics still apply within the quantum? That's a very important question. Because if they don't, that could lead to one conclusion. If they do, that means the universe will eventually, shouldn't it? Just end up as heat, very low grade heat. Yeah, I think that the question about validity of, for example, if we take second law of thermodynamics, what happens to entropy, it's also related to what 
what happened to time? How do we address the problem of time itself in such a framework? Because everything has to be relational. So one, some people think that the laws of thermodynamics which we perceive, these are also low energy effects in certain sense. And perhaps the second law of thermodynamics will reset itself when there will be a bounce or when there will be a similarity. So that question is really difficult to answer at least now in these models, and I will say models, these are toy models, really like Limitre had a type toy model, these are just toy models. Because as I said, there are no galaxies in this, there are no inhomogeneities in it. So really, to really understand thermodynamics of a system, like we understand natural gases, pressure, volume, temperature, and so on, we need molecules. Similarly, there are no molecules here. This is just like plain universe filled with a homogeneous field which is expanding and contracting or cycling and so on. There are no matter distributions here. So therefore we cannot really understand the issues of thermodynamics so far. So that is really a something which which is unanswered. Yes. I'd like to see if you would like to comment about this. In Sky Telescope or Astronomy, they made an announcement from the Webb Telescope. They have now detected large galaxies, you know, farther back in time than they ever imagined. Mm -hmm. is how does that affect things that that does not affect anything about quantum gravity because as like in 10 to the power minus 32 of the second the inflation ends all this phenomena of the bounce will end in 10 to the power minus 40th of the second after that it is all einstein's theory so that problem has to be countered by the standard cosmological model not by quantum gravity quantum gravity has done its job it just comes, cures the similarity, goes away. So we just have to adjust the formation of galaxies farther back. I think so. But that, that problem is more of classical astrophysics and classical general relativity. Okay. Quantum theory has nothing to do with that. So it's like saying that its problem is equal. And like if, 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 if it turns out that our mass distributions have some issue, let us say, which was thought so far, we won't be applying quantum mechanics on each other. We would be trying to understand our matter distribution using Newtonian mechanics, or at best Einstein's theory. So quantum using quantum mechanics on us is useless because that's not really applicable at our scales. So similarly, when the universe has already started forming stars and planets, quantum mechanics is redundant at that stage for the universe. Quantum gravity, I mean. Yes. If we look at the big bang. To me, uh, that always implies that there was a starting point in the universe. Nothing and something. Yeah. The big bounce, if I'm, if I'm understanding correctly, there must have been something before for the current universe to bounce against and, and start. I mean, if it didn't start from nothing, then it started from something, and that something is a previous universe that it back. So probably it's just like that cobra mm -hmm. in the Vedic philosophers. Well, so, and then yeah. the other thing zero which you bring up is that's not really T zero. Yes. It, it completely flips it on its head. Absolutely. So it's, that there is no T zero. There is no T zero. This un, so the universe so in some sense we are really going we are really touching those religious philosophies again. You know, it's eternal. It was always there. So some aspects of steady state, yeah. some aspects of Newtonian Einsteinian theory, some aspects of what Gamma was doing. It's kind of a mix of everything. It may be right. It may be completely wrong. I just don't know. But I agree. The, we are not really solving a problem. If you ask me truthfully, if you say, like, who set the initial conditions here? How did we get? It's fine, you can describe the Big Bang is not there and there is a big bounce and the universe is on the other side. That means this universe in which we are living has come from somewhere there. What started that? So the question just goes back. It's quite possible. So if the universe was cyclic, maybe it started from some real primeval fluctuation. In it's, it's quite possible that there was a primeval quantum fluctuation which led to many cycles and then we see our universe. So that may be the scientific answer. Yes. Um, yeah, this is uh, tagging on to what Craig asked earlier. Because I've had several thoughts 
well. Um, regarding what some people see as a conflict of the zoning models and and I've, I've wondered if um, there's been much work, and I've never seen anything about it, uh, for, not in detail anyway, of whether those sets of laws work on a matter of scale. And after, after a certain uh, point of whether uh, uh, properties of energy matter shift from one set of laws to another set of uh, predominant governing laws. And if, if, if anyone's been done any work on where that transition is. If that's what happens. So, so, it, so as I was mentioning, like it's it's not coming up here. So, uh, yeah, it was actually here. Due to the discreteness of the space time, gravity becomes repulsive. This we actually are able to prove. If you look at, so I'm just giving one small example to give an answer to your big question. The point is that what this universes will dust and radiation, these objects will attract each other, the attractive force of gravity. If you really take into these quantum effects into account, and it's a very detailed mathematics, and I'm not given any equations here. If you look at all those mathematical equations, which replace those Friedman and Rajchaudhary's equation, you are able to derive new set of equations, which at low densities give you the same equations of Einstein, but at very high densities, they change the signs. Whatever was positive becomes negative and vice versa, something like that. So the gravity which was attractive it just becomes repulsive in the very small scale near here, which causes this repulsive effect. Very similar to what happened, what inflation does. So inflation is a kind of matter which actually changes the sign again in this Rajchaudhary equation to make it repulsive in some form. What happens here is even far bigger repulsion than that inflationary phenomenon. So you're completely right. We still have to discover that the very reliably what equations replace Einstein's equations. It's not that Einstein's, Einstein's theory is wrong. Einstein's theory is completely correct from here at 10 to the power minus 30, 40th second till now. We know that. The question is before that. Similarly, Newton's, we don't need Einstein's gravity to describe this all or the dynamics of us. Newton's gravity is correct at those scales. So it's just a layer. Newton's gravity, Einsteinian relativity, and perhaps quantum gravity. So we just go deeper and deeper, and one one fits onto another. If you're going from one to the other, would some of the is it possible for some of these constants we have for our universe to change to in the next universe? So there might not be any life, or it can have totally different physics. It's quite possible. Mm -hmm. I haven't included that result here. That's something like. We have been working on that if the universe was actually cyclic, then it's quite possible that Newton's constant can change from one universe to another. What we we have a model in which it changes just by value of pi. But if there are many cycles like that, that value may change significantly after many cycles. So it's possible. I won't rule it out mathematically. But it's a mathematical model right now. Yes. Is that is the funnel is that the same or different than Einstein's? Rosenberg Bridge. It looks like that, but it's yeah. not. It's not. It's not that. But if you take that picture for black holes, if you go inside the black hole and look at the central singularity, then that funnel will be actually a wormhole, which has been studied earlier. So you can think of this being a. I didn't set this as a wormhole because wormhole is reserved for black hole spacetime or white hole spacetime. So this we just call as a bridge. But the characteristics are similar. The other thing is that the wormhole. When it exists, it's much bigger. This is extremely, extremely tiny. This is like 10 to the power minus 40th of meter. Wormhole is also said to be unstable. I do not want this to be really unstable. So that's just my personal wish. Like this is a this is a completely non-perturbative quantum gravitational bridge, which has very different properties than a wormhole. But a wormhole is also a bridge between two space times. This is also a bridge. Yes. One of the assumptions of the expanding universe is that eventually, you know, the expansion increases and just eventually blinks out into oblivion. But this seems to suggest that at some point it starts to fall back onto itself. Yeah. And, and um, so, so unless the universe collapses, 
then the next universe can't be created. Okay, so here the universe is contracting. Yes. Right? So if I have this pointer, it can the velocity can be up, the velocity can also be down. So there are just two solutions of velocity. It can have two signs. So the here the velocity is negative, here the velocity is positive. What you are saying is so if the the final fate of the universe depends on what is the dark energy to yeah. here. If it is cosmological constant, this universe will this universe, irrespective of where it came from, will have a very cold depth. Yeah. We know that. However, the data, the supernova data doesn't rule out that our dark <laughs> energy may be even more aggressive than cosmological constant. The equation of state of cosmological constant is minus one. The data does not rule out less than minus one. Yeah. If it is, which is called as a phantom dark energy, then Einstein's theory is again in trouble in future. What happens then is that in future, the universe will rip apart and there will be a big rip singularity, not, not a big bang singularity or a big crunch singularity. Then quantum gravity again comes in and causes a collapse and then it will collapse back and then there will be cycles and so on. So yes, then it would be right. But to really answer your question, we really need to have better supernova data to figure out what is the state of the universe today. We don't know that so that. Okay. So, remember we got uh, Dr. Professor from LSU who talked about the end of the universe more or less and the fact that on his, what he was working on is the evaporation of the protons. I see. At, at the very end. Now I'm assuming if they evaporate, that we're talking about going back to a quantum state or becoming part of the suit, the quantum suit. Now maybe that's what happens. But somehow that quantum effect then allows it to <laughs> form another universe. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's always no. possible that due to quantum fluctuation, another universe can bubble up. That's quite possible. But that will be like a baby universe coming mm -hmm. from, from this planet. But, but wait, was he, is he still correct about the possibility of protons and neutrons and everything evaporating if you give it enough time? That, in that sense, he's correct, but I don't think he said that we will form another universe from there. No, he, he was just talking about some other terms, but <laughs> I it occurred to me a lot of life, so what's going on here? Yes, so here, when the universe keeps expanding, he, he might be talking about the black holes completely evaporate, and then there is then there's a final cold depth of the universe. So that idea is correct. I have to cut this short. When we are, yeah. it's a bit of poverty. Yeah. 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 You know, once you close this, we collapse, it changes yeah. to a new yeah. year. Uh, if there's more questions, yeah. we can ask you a little bit here, but we need to uh, only close this out right now yeah. and get on with a little bit of our business. Yeah. We don't need a name. That seems more interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we have a 